Yo, four. He was the recipient of the Singapore Millennium Foundation Postdoctoral Research Scholarship in 2004 and the Lee Kuan Yew Postdoctoral Fellowship in 2006. His research interests include artificial and computational intelligence, machine learning, data le mining, and computational finance. He is currently a data scientist at Nelson Singapore and he is also an associate faculty at the <coughs> Singapore Institute of Management University. So Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, first of all, I'm very glad to be here to share with you uh, the work that I've done uh, over the past two years. Okay. So uh, today I'm going to talk about how we have actually used Python to build a data pipeline okay, to get the, the set of data that we need to solve a particular problem, in this case, rural urban classification. Uh, can those behind hear me? Because I don't have the mic, so I try to project my voice as loud as possible. Okay, sure. Okay. So, okay, uh, as the guy that introduced me just now mentioned, I'm actually a data scientist currently working at the Nelson company. So this project is actually, uh, the problem is actually a commercial <coughs> problem, okay, business problem. But I would say this project is more of an academic research project. The okay, reason why is because uh, I sit in the innovation team within Nelson. So as part of the job scope or you can say KPI, we have to actually engage with the local universities and uh, maybe uh, enter into joint research and collaboration with them. So this project was actually uh, written up as a final year, uh, undergraduate final year project, as well as internship project. So a couple, in fact, three students had actually worked with me on this project, okay? So this is the outline of my talk for today. First give you a background of what exactly we are trying to solve. Okay, so I'll define the problem so that you can appreciate the solution that I will share with you later. Okay, and then uh, I also share with you a bit about the geospatial basics. Okay, <coughs> just to let you uh, further understand the solution and how we actually put everything together. Okay, and then finally I'll go into the GIS data pipeline. Okay, the actual details, and then I'll just <coughs> conclude the talk. Okay. So these are the three students that have worked with me uh, on this project. Okay, you can see that two of them are actually doing this project as their undergraduate final year project, and they are actually from NUS. Okay, and the student in the middle is actually from NTU, and he actually worked on this project uh, during his summer internship with the company. Okay, first of all, the problem that we are trying to solve. Rural urban classification. Why do we want to actually look at rural urban classification? And what exactly is rural urban classification? Well, the background with this business problem is, okay, Nelson is a market research company, okay? So we actually send our data collectors out to collect field information or field data, okay? And one of the key services or product that we actually offer to our clients, in this case, our clients are actually fast-moving consumer goods uh, manufacturers like Unilever, PNG, uh, Nestle, uh, Coca Cola, uh, Pepsi Cola, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this product that we offer them is actually information about the size and composition of the retail market in the country that they are operating in. So the size and composition means we have to actually send our data collectors out, okay, to comb the area, the entire area, <coughs> identify the retail outlets, in this case the sales outlets, the stores. Okay, classify the stores based on certain criteria and also uh, to check what kind of products are being sold in the store. So these are the information that are actually important and relevant to our client. Because why? Why do they need this uh, information? Because they need to know the size and also the composition of the retail market in order to make strategic investment, whether they want to actually uh, open up a new product line and launch it in that country or they want to start up a new manufacturing plant. Okay, so for a small country like Singapore, it's no issue because Singapore, the land area is only 700 square kilometers. So we can send our team of data collectors out and comb every inch of the country, correct? But for a large country, I use an example here, Indonesia. Okay, Indonesia has a land area of 1.9 million square kilometers. Okay, there is no way we can send our data collectors out to comb every inch of the country. Moreover, Indonesia is so geographically diverse thousands and thousands of islands, okay? 
So it's actually practically impossible to actually send people to comb every inch of the country. Even if it's possible, it's going to take a long time and it's going to be very costly. Okay? When the cost is high, our clients are not going to pay for it. Okay? So what can we do? Okay? What we have done is, instead of looking at the entire country as a whole, we actually broke it up into very small pieces, or we call it regions. So it may be too small for you to see, but one block here is actually one survey region or one region of interest that we are interested in. Okay? And where the survey or the data collection will be carried out. Of course, even if we have broken up such a big country like Indonesia into very small pieces, in fact, the number of pieces here there are over 66,000 survey areas. So even with this small area, okay, there's still a large number of these small survey areas. It's still impossible to cover all of them. Okay, so what we have done is we make use of a concept called stratified random sampling. Okay, so stratified random sampling, uh, I provided a, a figure here to actually illustrate that concept. Essentially, you have a population that you want to get something, some information on. Okay, but instead of surveying or collecting data from every single object or element in that population, okay, you first group them based on some criteria, just like performing clustering. Okay, on a population with a large variation. This is to reduce the variation, okay, so that when you actually sample from each of the groups, okay, you can have a smaller sample size as well as not having to cover the entire population but still yet get information about the general population. So that is the concept of stratified random sampling. Okay? Now one of the key input okay to have good stratified random uh, good stratification or strata is the knowledge of the region being rural or urban. Why is that important? Because a rural region versus an urban region, you'll definitely have different kinds of stores, different size of stores, and also different types of stores. Okay? So in an urban area, you most likely will find stores like hypermarket, right? Or supermarket, where you have may maybe uh, many rows of products and also uh, Air con, air condition uh, premises, and also cash out, check out, uh, cash counters. But in the rural region, probably you have those mom and pop shop, or those are single operator or proprietary <coughs> operated uh, stores. So the store profiles are very different. That's why when you have this situation, we try to group them okay, into distinct groups before we perform the sampling and then the data collection. So one of the key input to perform this grouping is the knowledge of rural and urban classification on rural or urban status of that region. Okay? Now traditionally, okay, we can actually get such information from maybe say some uh, official statistical bureau of the country. In this case maybe uh, the uh, Indonesian government they have a uh, official statistical bureau. Traditionally we can actually get this information from them. But for Indonesia because it's a very fast emerging economy. So things change very fast. Regions that are urban, maybe half a year later or a year later can become, uh, regions that are rural, half a year or a year later can become urban. But official data is very slow and it's very patchy. They probably update the data with a new release of the database every three, four years. So in between, there's a huge gap. And if we do not do something about it, okay, we'll lose the accuracy of the data. And once this grouping is not done correctly, when we perform our data collection on these samples and we project it up to get the information about the general population of stores in the country, we are going to be aware of. Okay? So that is actually the background of the problem. So what we have done initially okay, is we actually look at remote sensing. Okay? Why? Because it's very obvious to a human being. Okay? If I look at the satellite imagery, uh, images, Okay, I have provided two here. First of all, you can see that okay, they are actually taken at the same altitude. Okay? And the second thing is that it's very clear or very distinct to us that which one is an urban area, which one is a rural area. Right? Because the human eye can recognize that these are actually buildings. And when we have a lot of buildings, we associate to a high level of urban development. Okay? Whereas versus the satellite image at the lower half, you can see that it's actually open field or probably uh, paddy field. Okay? So what we have done previously is we have 
actually uh, conducted a pilot okay, uh, in the province of Bali in Indonesia. Okay, and we procure the satellite images of Bali okay, and then we actually do some image processing to extract the information from these images and then we have a data set and we use it to build a supervised classifier. Okay, so we just extract the information in terms of the uh, building density or uh, open field density and so on and so forth. There's a few features, land use characteristics that we actually extract from the images through image processing. And once we have the data set, we can build our classifier. Now that is very good, okay? And we have actually quite a high accuracy in terms of the classification rate between rural and urban or different shades of uh, urban development. We have accuracy up to about 96, 97%. That is great, okay? But the problem with using satellite images is, okay, because we are actually near the equatorial belt, okay, there's the issue of cloud covers. So when the cloud covers is actually over an, a region or an area, and the satellite happen to take the image of the photo at that time, you can't see anything beneath it, okay? So I have uh, highlighted the issue of the cloud cover here. So the white patches is actually a cloud, and this is the shadow created by the cloud cover. So you can see that if you do image processing on such an image, you're going to have quite a big problem. Okay? Another thing is coloration. Okay? So these patches here, the green one, the dark green and the light green, they are open area. It's just that they have different shades of green. Again, when you do image processing, if you are in the image processing field, you may find that it's probably not easy to handle all this kind of thing. Variation. And also imaging conditions, lighting as well as instrumentation issues. We have actually quite a problem with instrumentation issues because when we actually purchase satellite image over Bali, right, from the commercial satellite provider, one of their satellite actually failed. And a portion of our data is actually corrupted and we can't make use of that portion. Okay, so that is the issue with instrumentation. And lastly, okay, the most important point is cost. Satellite images is going to cost you a bomb, okay? because I have actually inquired and they are going to charge us a square kilometer USD 1.25. So you imagine for Indonesia, if you still recall the land area is 1.9 million square kilometer. You just do a simple calculation, it's about 2.5 million USD per year because we have to actually repeat this exercise every year before we uh, send our data collectors out to actually collect the information because we have to actually give this information, updated information to our client on a yearly basis. Okay, so that is the issue with the current uh, approach using satellite imaging. Okay, so what can we do next? We scratch our head, okay, we try to think what other approaches we can use instead of satellite images. And we realized one important thing. Okay, I'm not sure whether you can see uh, the blue line here, okay, but the blue line represents the boundary of the region that we are interested in, okay, to evaluate whether it's rural or urban. And this is the satellite images overlay on it. Okay. So you can see that these two, two, uh, these two images are actually of the same area. Just that one is satellite image, the other one is actually the street view or street map, uh, street map uh, image. Okay. So when you overlay, okay, and the white lines here are actually the roads. So if you overlay, you can see that the roads actually coincide with the buildings. Okay, so instead of having to do image processing on the raw satellite image, okay, to identify where the buildings are or where the houses are and then identify the density, uh, compute the density of these buildings, okay, we can look at the roads as a proxy because the roads, okay, will pass through the buildings and the settlements, okay. It's very intuitive when you, we have houses, we have buildings, we have settlements, we have human settlements, definitely there will be roads. Okay. No one will build a big cluster of house there without any road access, correct? So the road access and the road will actually coincide with where the locations of the buildings are. So with this observation, it's possible that we can use road information instead of satellite images to actually get what we want. In this case, to build a supervised classifier to perform rural urban classification. Okay. And just to <coughs> motivate the use of road network information, I have shown here, okay, 
one rural urban, uh, rural as well as one urban in the next slide. Okay. So for the rural region, you can see that the corresponding roads that pass through this rural region, okay, we have very long road segment, okay, very little intersection and branching, okay. As compared to a highly urban region, you can see that the profile of the road network is very different. Correct. So we can, if we have this road network, okay, if we can extract information like the number of intersections, the number of road segments, the length of the road segments, or the average length of the road segments, and all this relevant information, we can use it to actually build our classifier. Okay. And the best thing about using road network is, okay, it doesn't suffer from the limitations of using satellite images. Once the road net <coughs> network is mapped, okay, it's not susceptible to cloud covers, okay, it's not susceptible to coloration, right? Of course, imaging condition is also not an issue. And cost, we can actually get the road network at a relatively low cost as compared to satellite images. Okay, so these are the considerations when we decided that we probably want to take a second approach instead of using satellite images, using road network information to do what we want to do. Okay, so before I present to you the the Python uh, based uh, GIS data pipeline, I just want to quickly go through some of the very fundamental concepts of digital cartography and uh, geospatial information system. Okay, the world that we live <coughs> in is actually a 3D world, right? But the map that we are familiar with is actually a 2D view of the world. So there must be some transformation to actually transform or project a location on the globe to a point on the map. Okay. So this transformation is actually handled in GIS using a concept called coordinate reference system. And this coordinate reference system consists of two parts. One, it has to make an assumption of the model of the world, whether it's a spherical model or a episodical model. And once it decided which model to use, then it will do some mathematical calculation to project a GPS location from the 3D to the 2D space. Okay, so it's something like you have a 3D object, you unfold it to become 2D. Okay, and digital cartography and GIS applications and research now is very popular because we have very good access to online map providers. Some of these are actually Google Maps, Bing Maps, OpenStreetMap. And how to actually these are map providers actually serve the map to us. Okay. I believe all of you have used Google Maps before, right? So when you search for an area, the Google Map server will actually return you your result, display the map on your uh, view, your window view. Okay. And as you pan or move the your location around, the maps will be updated. You can zoom in and zoom out as well. But how do all this happen at the back end? Okay. So the entire map, okay, you can actually zoom in at different level. At the highest level is zoom level zero. I think for Google Map, at the highest or the lowest zoom <coughs> level is actually can be about zoom level twenty or something like that. Okay. But with, with each zoom level, okay, you can see more details. But this comes at a price because when you see more details, that means more data needs to be transmitted or transferred to you before you can see what is happening on the map. Imagine if I'm at a zoom level, let's say 14, 15, which is very common uh, zoom level that we use, okay, if you're familiar with Google Map. Zoom level 14, 15 is already gigabytes of data. Okay, If the online map server is going to transfer the gigabyte of data to you, it's going to take a long time for you to load the map. And if you pan around a lot, it's even slower. So there's no way they are going to send the entire world map to you at a zoom level that you choose. So what they have done is, they did it in a very clever way. The entire world map, okay, even a particular zoom level, let's say zoom level three, they slice it into grids called map tiles. Okay, and if you query a particular region, they only serve you the map tile of that region and probably the surrounding tiles as well. So that it's very easy and very fast for you to load what you are actually looking at. And then when you pan, they just keep on serving you the corresponding map tiles. Okay. So how do they actually cut up the entire world map? at a particular zoom level into tiles and each tile is actually fixed no matter at which zoom level you are at each map tile is always 256 by 256 pixel okay 
So you can see that at zoom level is low, the entire world map is actually represented by one tau. Then at zoom level one, both the x and the y dimension doubles. So it becomes four squares. <coughs> okay? And then at zoom level two, again, it doubles from zoom level one. So instead of having two tau on the x and the y dimension, okay, it becomes four. So you have four times four, 16. And this keeps doubling up with each zoom level that you go deeper into. It's when you can see more details, okay? So just to give you an example, if there's a particular region that I want to query, I want to view on my PC, let's say I'm using Google Map or Bing Map or OpenStreetMap, the concept is the same, okay? I have this particular region in the purple, I color it purple that I want to view. So what the map server, online map server is doing is, you are first detect the lower left and the upper right corner of the extent of this region. Okay, in GIS terminology, extent means the smallest rectangular polygon that actually contains the region of interest that you are interested in viewing. Okay? And with these two corners, I can then calculate through some simple mathematical calculations, work out what is the corresponding <coughs> tau number, map tau number that I need to assess. And <coughs> once I have the map tau number for this corner and the map tau corner for that corner, I just take the difference in terms of the numeric number, I will know the number of map tiles that I need to download and which map tile that I need to download. Yeah? Because the map tile is just like the addresses of the square grids that you want to download. So for the same region, when I download the setup image, it's something like this. You can see that each tile is actually 256 by 256 pixel, and when I piece the tiles together, I can get the image that I want. Okay? Now, it's simple to say that when I download the tiles, I just piece them together. But when you download the tiles, they are actually images. They are not geo reference. It's just like playing jigsaw puzzle. You can assess the individual pieces, but how do you put them together before you form the complete picture or the mosaic picture? Okay. So you have to then geo reference these images, and then use a library called the GDAR library to actually stitch them together, to merge them together, to form the complete big picture that you want. So uh, with that, I'll just go into the GIS pipeline that we have developed using Python. Okay. Here I actually uh, want to mention that we actually use a few uh, Python libraries like GDEL, OGR, and Fiona, and Shapely. Okay. These are the three main uh, Python modules that we use. And this is the overview of the pipeline that we have developed using Python. Okay, I'm sorry that Maybe the resolution is not that good. But here is actually the boundary of the region that we are interested in uh, assessing. And then when we have the digital boundary, okay, we get, like I said, we get the extent of the region. Then we work out what are the tiles that we need to download. Then we go to the online app server, download the tiles. Then we use GDAO library to actually stitch them back together. But because we are interested in getting the road network information of a region, that we are wanting to do a rural urban classification. So this will contain access information. That means those roads that are outside the region, we don't want. We want to cut them away. So again, we use the GDAR library to click away, and this is the final image or the source data that we want to process to further do our processing to extract the road network information. Okay. So essentially, this is what we have. Okay. We download that from the online app server, but these are images. Okay. I have to tell you that these are images and to a algorithm, to a machine learning uh, algorithm or technique, they cannot operate on these images because they will not be able to see that these are roads and this is an intersection between three segments of roads. So what can we do? We have to actually convert these images, raster information to vector information. Okay. Vector information means the lines. Once we have the vector information, as GIS vector information, we can then measure the length okay, using uh, Shapely module in Python. Okay, measure the length and also identify the intersection of the points. Okay, so this is what we had actually wanted to achieve. And a blown out area, blown out view of this small area here. You can see that 
Okay, the algorithm that we develop, the pipeline that we develop, is able to correctly identify the intersection points which are actually denoted as the purple dots, and also the endpoints of the road segment, which is the green dots. Okay, so this is what we want to achieve. Once we have the intersection point and the end point, we can then measure the distance between two characteristic points. In this case, characteristic point can be end points or intersection points. Okay, we can measure the length of this road segment. We can also count the number of road segments, and so on and so forth. We extract information about the density, road network density. Once you have this, okay, it's basically uh, feature engineering from the raw data that you know. Once we have the feature engineering, we have a data set that we can work with. We then pass it through our machine learning algorithms, and it will come out okay, as a classifier that we can use. Okay, so that is essentially the gist of what we are trying to do. Okay, now the pipeline that I'm showing here is only the first part of the entire story because from the online net provider, okay, we are able to get the image showing the load network information of the region that we're interested in. But these are images, like I say, we have to convert it to uh, we have to convert it to a raster to vector information. So the second part of the pipeline is to convert the raster information to vector information. So what we have done is we have to first convert the images into binary images, that means black and white images. Okay? The module that we have used is the Python image library or PLO. Okay, it's very easy to use. You just convert probably a grayscale image to a black and white image. Okay. Why do we need to convert it to a black and white image? It's because we want to perform morphological theming. Okay? Because the raw image, okay, there's thickness in the road network. Each road segment there's thickness. We are only interested in the center line of the, the road segment, which is the corresponding line here. Because what we are interested in is only the connectivity, connectivity of the road network as well as the length of the network. Okay, so from that, we have to first thin it first. Okay, once we have the thin image, okay, we then convert it from raster to vector using the GDAL library. Inside the GDAL library, there's a function called GDAL polygonize. So if you are familiar with GIS, you just use GDAL polygonize. Okay, it will convert a raster image to a vector shape file. Okay? Once you have that, okay, you, are, you can then start to play with the vector information. You can start tracing the line segments or the road segments, identify the intersection points, okay? identify the end points. Okay? And then from there, you can extract information about your road work, road load, uh, density and connectivity. So with this approach, okay, we are able to benchmark the approach that we build our classifier with road network information versus the approach that we build our classifier with satellite images information. You can see that both are actually very comparable. But in terms of processing, we don't have to actually do image processing, which is very computationally intensive. We don't have to actually pay a huge cost to get the image. Just, and we are free from things like coloration, instrumentation issues, cloud covers. Okay? So I'll just quickly conclude before I actually show you the demonstration of the pipeline. Okay. So what I covered is our previous approach where we use satellite images okay, to do the classification. Now we actually use network information extracted from online maps to do the same thing, to achieve the same result that we want. Okay? And as part of future work, we'll be looking at using copy graph theory to further extract useful features from the road network information that we have uh, able to retrieve from the online maps. Okay. So with that, I'll just uh, do a demonstration of the data pipeline. So for visualization, I'll be using uh, Quantum GIS, QGIS. It's an open source uh, GIS platform, similar to MapInfo or ArcGIS, if you're familiar with GIS. Okay. So this is an example of uh, the, the region that I'm interested in. Okay. It's a polygon, and 
the boundaries of the uh, polygon or region is actually uh, lines. So if I turn off the shading with inside the polygon, okay, you can see the boundaries. Okay, this is the boundary of the region that I'm interested in. Okay, so I will use this boundary, go to the online map server to pull down the corresponding tiles, stitch them together to form the mosaic image, the bigger image of the entire region. Okay, that is part one of the data pipeline. And then after that, I process, I do some processing on this image to convert from raster to vector information. So the first part of the data pipeline is actually handled by this particular executable. I have compiled the Python script into EXE using Py installer. <coughs> okay, so that it's easier for for me to actually do the demonstration. Okay. I have just created a very simple console based UI. Okay. So there are some options that I need to set. But if I don't set the options, I just use the default. Okay, you will go to uh a particular online map provider to pull down the map tiles and the images. So it will launch a simple file dialog UI. Okay. Now before I go on, I just shift this file out. Okay. So I'll be using this file, can KMZ is a keyhole markup zip file that contains the boundary of the region that I'm interested in. Evaluating is a uh, real urban status. I use this okay, as the input to my pipeline. Okay. And then you will see that a new folder will be created and the information that, that I pull from the online map provider will be stored inside that folder. Okay, so you can see that this part here is actually calculating the extent and then pulling down the map tiles one by one. So each map tile is 256 by 256. Okay. And I, if I'm not wrong, I think I have used the default setting at zoom level 15 or 17. Okay. So at different zoom level, the details and the information that you see on the image that you pull down will be different. Okay, it's done. Okay, so I pull down all the images and the tiles for this particular region, and you can see that here a new folder called roads is being created. Just now, this folder is not there, and inside here is actually the a subfolder containing the information of that region that I just uh, use as the input source to the pipeline. You can see that all of these are actually tiles, 256 by 256 tiles that are being put now. Okay, the dimensions 256 by 256, and these are all the raw images. Okay. And these raw images, okay, the pipeline has already geo-referenced it. That means already assigned a G GPS position for this map tile so that when I use GDAL library to actually stitch them together, it will know where to actually place each tile. Okay, so this is the merge image, okay, the entire merge, merge image from all the small tiles. Okay. And then because the region that I'm interested in is not the entire rectangle, but it's only a subset. So I want to keep the boundaries, overlay the boundaries on this image and then clip it. So this is the clip result. Okay. You can see that. Basically, it's the same for this bigger part here, then the rest that is outside the boundary is all clipped away. So, I just load this in into QGIS for better visualization.
Okay, I turn off this first. Then I change the order at which I actually plot. Okay, it's, it's not coming up very clear on the screen, okay? Okay, but, but it's okay. Uh, the boundaries will be exactly what you would expect it to be, this one. So I just switch. Okay. Why does it come up black? So Oh, okay. I should have changed this. <coughs> ah, okay. So you can see this is the original image, and this is the yellow line is actually the boundary of the region that I want. And when I click it, click, click with respect to the boundary, this is what I have. Now these are images, it's still images. Images are no use for our computer algorithm because we can't extract features out of it. So I have to convert this raster information to vector information. So how do I do that? That's the second part of the pipeline. Okay. So as I mentioned just now, I'll first convert it to black and white, do the thinning, and then after that, polygonize the raster image to vector information. So the image that I'll be operating on will be this image here. So I just put it out to the desktop. Okay. Again, a file dialog will be launched, okay, which will to allow me to select which file I want to operate on. So I want to operate on this file which is what is shown here, which is this particular file here. So you can see, it's now, it has been converted from gray image to a black and white binary image, and then it's now doing thinning. Okay. So for this particular demo case that I have, there are about 12 iterations. Okay, it will take only uh, 10 20 seconds to run. Okay, so let's just give it a moment. Okay, I'm fin finishing up. Okay. So it's done, and these are the extra files that are being created. So This is the road that I want, okay? Okay, the end point and the roads profile. Okay, let me zoom in. You can see that the lines are exactly in the middle of the roads. Okay, so that is the vector information that I want. And once with that vector information, identify the end points. I can also identify the intersect points. I just load it up for you to see. Where's my intersect points? You have an intersect point file here. Okay, never mind. But you get the idea. Okay, once I have this vector information, 
Okay, I can then trace the length of a segment and then the number of segments and so on and so forth. So that is the end product that we want. And then we can extract the features from there and do our class-wise uh, learning and build our class files. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Questions for the CEO? Yes. Are you trying to get a minimum, minimum spending tree out of those? Uh, could be. It's part of the feature engineering. Okay. What I've shown you is the pipeline to get where we want before we extract the features. It occurs to me that you can use a minimum spending tree Correct. versus a set of detections. Correct. Yeah. We can even a apply advanced graph theory to actually yeah, extract yeah. more uh, informative features. Okay. Cool. Okay. Any other questions? If not, it'll be the end of this talk. The next talk will be about deep learning with Python and